Welcome to this week's episode of Catholic Recon, Testimonies from Reverts and Converts. I'm Eddie Trask, your host. And before I introduce our guest, I just wanted to invite you or remind you to subscribe to my channel. I really want to get the word out as much as possible. If you know anyone that is a Catholic revert or convert, please direct them to my website, eddietrask.com, and I will reach out to them as soon as possible. With that, today's guest is Eric McCullough. Eric, welcome. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for coming on the show, buddy. And yeah. uh, before we get into this, I just wanted to let people know that I, over the past this is God working. Over the past few weeks, I have heard a number of testimonies. And Eric actually was probably one of the first that I heard um, after being introduced to some really, really stellar uh, people in this community. And just like the other people, I, I got bits and pieces. But once I thought, once I got Eric on the show, then he can, you know, really cover a comprehensive testimony. So, Eric, do your best, buddy. <laughs> All right, thank you. Oh, it's good to be able to share this story. Um, um, my conversion was complete uh, April 2017 when I came into um, our Holy Catholic Church on Easter. Um, and it was a fast journey. It was uh, an unexpected journey. Um, it, it wasn't planned. It wasn't something that I was seeking to have happen. It just kind of came out of the blue and it went really fast. Um, probably faster than my wife probably wanted it to happen. Um, but um, so for me, I grew up in the church. I was uh, in, in a Protestant church, really. Um, pretty much almost born in the church. I was born on Easter Sunday. Um, it, right in service happened. My mom, the, the pregnancy happened right in church service. And so I've been a been in church pretty much my whole life, and um, actually, at a at a teenage age, felt a calling to become a pastor, and uh, eventually, kind of pursued that, um, and was in pastoral ministry for several years, um, and then eventually, kind of put that aside to be uh, a dad that could probably you know take care of his family a lot better. Uh, in, in a lot of Protestant ministries, you find that, um, you know, if you're not part of a large church and a lot of small organizations, it's really hard to take care of your family and to, to meet ends meets. And so, you know, when my wife and I finally had our first child, it was like, maybe I should find something that's a little bit different career. So we ended up, um, I became a teacher and, and changed careers. And so you know, I wasn't pastoring, but I was still involved in ministry, uh, working with children's ministry a lot and serving in that way. Um, so we, we, we were born and raised here. This is where our home is for us. And um, we'd moved away for some ministry stuff and came back. And I started hanging out with my brother-in-law a lot more. And he converted to Catholicism when he, um, he met a, a Catholic girl. And um, her family was, you know, very much Catholic and said, you know, if you, if you want to marry our daughter, you have to be Catholic. And so, you know, it's just, that was, you know, kind of the condition. So, you know, he, he looked into it and he decided to convert and, you know, to the shock of the family. I mean, it was kind of amazing that it happened. It was, I think for a lot of the family, they couldn't understand it and we didn't really know why. Um, and so we would be hanging out together and we would have some pretty heated discussions you know, kind of arguing back some of the, um, you know, different points of faith. And the great thing was, is with him and I, it was all in a spirit of love. We could have some really heated discussions sometimes, be very passionate on one side or the other, but very much in a sense of love with each other. And it wasn't in a way of, you know, trying to hurt each other. Sure. Um, so it really allowed those conversations to continue. And I don't know what it was. I mean, I was not seeking to be Catholic. I had no desire. Um, I was still trying to maybe bring him back <laughs> away from the Catholic church, but we were having a discussion one night and I've heard the question before. I, I, I probably have pondered it before, but for some reason, I think the Holy spirit have finally found his way through. And my brother-in-law asked me this question he said, so who put the Catholic Bible together? And, and I really kind of pondered that. And I was like, I, 
think it was the Catholic Church. And it's kind of known where he's from. He's like, yeah, it was the Catholic Church that put, you know, the Bible together. And for some reason, in that moment, it it really dawned on me. It kind of stuck. Um, and it forced me to ask the question, okay, if the Catholic Church put the Bible together, what else did they have right? It, as a Protestant, the Bible is the really is the source of all my faith. You know, I can't, if it's not in the scriptures, I can't believe it. And so it really kind of irritated me that if, if my source of authority has an outside of authority, and I don't know anything about that authority, I should probably find out who it is and what they are and what else do they believe and really find out the truth of this claim that, you know, they put the Bible together. What else do they have right? And, you know, I just decided to investigate that. I'm like, okay, well, let's figure that out. Let's find out what else do they know. And so I, I um, didn't really know where to go. And I asked my next door neighbor, who is a Catholic as well. I went over and talked to him. I just poked some questions at him. And he's like, well, you know, Holy Apostles, they've got a library um, that, you know, I'm sure they could probably lend you out some books to read. So I just, I went over to Holy Apostles one day and I, I asked him if I could borrow some books from the library. And she said, well, we don't really have a library, but we've got some books in this um, conference room on the shelf that you're welcome to kind of just take your time, look through them, pick out anything you want and take them and go read them. And so I picked out three books. Uh, the first book was uh, Four Witnesses by Rod Bennett, um, Catholicism and Fundamentalism uh, by Carl Keating and um, Rome Sweet uh, Rome with um home yeah rome sweet home um and so those were the first three books that and i didn't know what i was picking out honestly <laughs> i just was like going through the books that were up there and i was trying to find out you know maybe that could give me some understanding of the church and those three really kind of popped out to me and and so i read uh the four witnesses by rod bennett first and that was a lightning rod in me um as a Protestant, oftentimes our history of the church goes from the apostles and then has this giant blank hole to, you know, the time of really the Reformation. Sure. There's just this giant hole. And, and so it's really hard to then to start reading some of the early church fathers and realize that they're very Catholic too. <laughs> Yeah. You know, the thing, the way that they worship, the, 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 the things that they believed and the things they talked about. And, you know, even, you know, having, you know, Peter being in Rome, I mean, that was a big kind of like, whoa, these were things that just were not a part of my history. They were not a part of my instruction. They were just a huge gap in my hole. And so when I read that, I was, I was shocked and I was like, whoa, I'm in trouble. <laughs> there's a, there's a lot here that, it has just come at me. A lot of truth has come at me. A lot of, you can't really refute history. I mean, these events happened, you know, they're not like theological things that you can debate about. They're historical events. And I was so kind of, I think, just stunned by it all, rocked by it all. I emailed the author of that book and I'm like, I don't know what to do. I'm like, I, I don't know if I want to become Catholic, but there's this whole history of the Catholic church. that's all of a sudden, you know, right in my face and I can't ignore it. I don't know what to do. And, uh, you know, thankfully he was, he was a presence of mind to say, okay, just slow down. You know, the Holy Spirit, he's watching over you. He's, he's going to lead you. He's going to guide you. Just pray. And uh, I asked him for some more things to read. And, um, you know, he, he recommended Catholic answers. Listen to them. Um, he also recommended uh, Marcus Grodi and the journey home and those videos. He said, you know, watch those videos. Um, so I started just doing that. I started, I finished reading the other books started reading or listening to um, Catholic Answers and listening to Marcus Grodi. Um, and then Marcus Grodi, like um, the thing that really got me with him was he did a lot of series on deep in history and talking about a lot of this historical stuff and a lot of men in history that were very, you know, profound Catholics and it was just really good information for me to kind of start putting some pieces together. Um, so I still wasn't completely convinced. I was not like, oh yeah, I'm gonna become Catholic now. That's it, that's all I need. I was not totally convinced on this. I had, I had a lot of prejudice on the Catholic church. I, I grew up with kind of more on the side of uh, Christianity that was looked at the, the church as the antichrist and um, 
you know, or I, the Pope is the Antichrist and the church is uh, the whore of Babylon. Was it a specific denomination or was this more non-denominational? Yeah, I grew up in, I grew up in a non-denominational, but I've been a part of many different denominations. Okay. Um, and that's a piece of Protestantism. I mean, you kind of create your own, your own belief system you want that fits and is comfortable for you. Sure, sure. You know, or, you know, whoever's just doing the style that you like at the time, you kind of bounce around a follow where you want to be. Got it. Um, so I, I, I needed to know more. I needed to, to learn some more information. And so um, I heard that St. Mark's had a library. And so I went over to St. Mark's and they have, I don't know if they still do, but at the time they had a great library. I mean, I could, as I was watching videos and I was listening to people, books that they would talk about, I could go over there and I could find those books uh, in their library, check them out and read them. And that was a huge help for me because that's what I needed. I needed information. I needed to learn these things. And for me, that was how I could process this. But as I was doing that, I was starting to see that, um, man, there's a lot more to this church than I realized. And I'm starting to be convinced on it. I'm, I'm hitting so many different truths that I can't ignore this and I got to keep investigating it. But I also knew that if, if this is kind of leading the direction where it's going, if, if, if I'm starting to fill a pulse to this church, I need to do due diligence for my family. Um, you know, I need to be able to have an articulate answer as to why am I making this decision? Um, especially for my wife. Um, sure. And so, you know, I'm not really sure. I'm just reading a lot, still discovering a lot of things. And so, you know, I was talking to Holy Apostles and, you know, they're like, well, you should join RCIA. And I was talking to Mary Wax and she goes, well, you're probably not going to learn as much through the program as what you've read and you've learned through the church. But she says, it's a really good place to um, just enter in and continue that discovery. And then if, you, if God calls you to the church, then you're in that process and you can join the church when you're ready. So I was like, okay, I'll join, but I'm not convinced. I'm not ready to become Catholic. I still think what I was trying to do was look for that one piece that would, would pull the whole straight of cards down and say, this thing is just completely false. And I've just been duped. I, I was looking for that piece to, um, to, to just pull it all apart. Or I was looking for that final piece to say, yeah, this is the absolute reason why I should be a Catholic. Yeah. Neither of which I found, <laughs> uh, um, really for me, um, I was going through RCA and at the time I was reading um, St. Francis de Sales and it was a book that kind of pieced together a lot of the articles that he had written to kind of convince converts to Protestantism at the time back to the Catholic Church. Okay. And his arguments were so sound and just fabulous, right? And I was reading this and I had just come to a point where I was like, there are a lot of smart men in this church. <laughs> like they're a lot smarter than I am. They have intelligence that goes beyond what I could ever grasp at times. How is it that I think I could find the reason that this is all a sham or that I would need to have this solid convincing proof when there's so much evidence all around it? Good, good. So point. Yeah. For me, it was just at that moment, I just, I just surrendered. I said, okay, God, I get it. And it was just a moment of surrendering and saying, I don't need to have this final proof text. I don't need to have a definitive answer. I can see enough truth and I can see enough of the history of the church now. And I could feel you calling me to the Eucharist that this has got to be where I need to be at. And I, and I made the decision at that point. I said, I'm going to become Catholic. And it was just a complete surrender at that point. Um, so for me, you know, if I were to sum up really kind of the, the, the three big things that led me to the church were one was the history of the church. Um, the history of the church, just, you can't argue that. I mean, yeah, there's, there, you know, there's, there's things in the history of the church that kind of make you look at it and go, Ugh, you know, that's kind of crazy. And, but I mean, that's also just human nature. I mean, you could look at the history of any Protestant denomination and be like, Ugh, you know, and yeah. some crazy yeah. stuff there too. Yeah. Um, so the history for me was huge because you can't, you can't refute that. There has been historical evidence of the Catholic church since the time of Christ until today. And, and you can't, you can't do that with any other denomination. It, it just doesn't exist. I mean, it, the Catholic church is the only thing that was instituted by Christ and has remained throughout all of history until today. And you can't refute that. That just is evidence that is based upon historical facts. So that was huge for me. 
the the other piece for me was the magisterium of the church the teaching authority of the church was huge and i always had struggled with this as a pastor when someone would come to me and say well why can't i blah 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 you know it doesn't say so in the bible so why can't i and that, and that was always hard for me because you know i had to have an answer for it in the scriptures yeah you know and that's because that's the source of my faith but what happens when the scriptures can't answer that question for you especially we move into modern times when science and things that are advancing at such a pace that you can't really find an answer for it in scriptures you need somebody to look at that and decide is this moral or not yeah and who is going to do that for you as a protestant it's you you have to make that decision well man i'm not smart enough to make that decision <laughs> And I don't want to rest my soul on a decision that I think I can make on my own. I mean, that's huge. And so having the, the, a teaching arm of the church there to say, man, this is right, this is wrong, is so reassuring. It's so peaceful to just know that I can go there and there is somebody who is researching this. There is somebody who is praying about this. There is somebody who is looking at this in the context of the history of the church, the traditions of the church, the teaching teachings of the church and trying to make a decision on that, that I could never, I could never make on my own. I yeah. would never have the knowledge, the resources or the time to make that decision. Um, but even then, just even theological things that are so hard to grapple in the scriptures that you, as Protestants, we often argued on what a verse meant. <laughs> you know, we would, we would wrestle over that and say, no, it means this. And then, no, it means that. And you could take it many different directions. And you see that all the time. And, you know, churches break up because of some belief over a certain particular texts of the scriptures. Yeah. Um, and so having that teaching authority of the church was so reassuring and, and knowing that we can trust that. I mean, that is so beautiful that that church, the church provides that for us, that it is just, it's so reassuring, so comforting, and so peaceful to know that it's there to just put trust in that and rest in that something that drew me to the Catholic Church as well. And the third thing for me was the Eucharist. Um, it, amazingly enough, you know, as a Protestant, we believe that we have to have the scriptures to, to base everything on. And yet the way that we treat communion is not anything close to what the scriptures call it to be. I mean, nothing at all. And when I started to understand this, especially when you look at it and when Jesus says that this is my body, that this is my blood, you can't get anything else out of that than what it is literally what he's saying. He's not, you know, he's not just making up, well, I, I want you to kind of believe that this, or, you know, this is a symbol of my body. He's literally saying it is, you know, and then you look in other texts of the scriptures and when they argue that with him, like, how can this be? How can we eat your body? Yeah. And he doubles down on that. And he's like, no, this is my body. And it causes people to walk away. And he didn't be like, oh, guys, I was just being symbolic at that moment. Hey, hold on. Come back. Come back. back. Let me, let me explain this for you. No, he was like, no, this is. And so when I, when I um, really kind of came to conclusion that, yeah, this is really the body and blood of Jesus Christ, looking at the scripture text, looking at what the church teaches on that. I was attending mass, you know, and just trying to discover and understand this. And I'll never forget that after I had come to, you know, a belief in that this is the body and blood of Jesus Christ, I was at mass. And when the priest lifted up the host, he said, behold, the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. I, I just wept like a baby. I was like, I'm literally beholding Jesus at this moment. Like this is the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. I am right now before Jesus. And I just wept. And from that moment on, could not wait until I was able to receive my Lord and Savior in Holy Communion and, and longed and hungered for the day that that could happen. And I remember when on, on Easter, when I came into the church and I received him the first time, I just, I wept for so long afterwards. It was like, he is finally in me. And it was just, it was just like I was whole again. And so, you know, those were the three big things for me that really were, this is why I'm going to become Catholic. And there's, you know, there's various other reasons that I, I become Catholic. And as I continue to learn, as I continue to grow, that you're like, yeah, this is even more reason why, you know. Yeah. Um, but I think oftentimes what I, I say to folks, you know, becoming Catholic, you know, when I was a Protestant, I was devoted. I was, you know, a very devoted follower of Christ. I, you know. I lived the faith and I loved my Lord and Savior and um, 
did the very best that it can to, you know, spread the gospel and to love others and to, to love God. That was what I, I just did. I loved telling people about Christ. I loved teaching people about our faith. And, but becoming Catholic, I've discovered that my faith is enriched and strengthened in so many other ways. And I didn't really understand this for the longest time. I remember being in RCAA and I listened on the radio and they kept talking about, um, you know, coming, coming in and in the fullness of the faith. Yeah. I'm like, what are you talking about the fullness? I have faith. Right. And then I started realizing what sacraments are and that, and that, that they, they give us that grace that fills us so that we can, we can live this commission to spread the gospel throughout the world. It gives us that grace. It sanctifies us so that we can be strengthened and we can be full of the faith to do that. And it finally dawned on me as a Protestant, I was like a one, one legged soldier of Christ, right? I'm just limping along because I only have a couple of the sacraments available to me. I had the sacrament of marriage, which, you know, in its own way was a, is a beautiful, beautiful thing because it helped me to change. I didn't really understand that until I become a Catholic and realizing that what this marriage can do to you. And then my baptism, that's, that's what I had. And not knowing that, but I, 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 I limped along as a soldier of Christ with that. And then you become a Catholic and it's like, I'm, I have access to the rest of the sacraments. And now I've got both of my legs and I can run full force. I can, I can definitely now, I'm not limping along anymore. I, I'm in the fullness of the faith because I have the sacraments that, that fill me with the grace that I need to do that. And so it's just a beautiful thing. But so, you know, I made that, I had mentioned earlier that I had I made the decision when I was reading St. Francis of Sales, I'm going to become Catholic. And so... I need to tell my wife now because <laughs> the whole time, you know, for her, she's watching me read these things. I'm, I'm talking about it with her. I'm like, babe, did you know this? Read this. Oh my goodness. What about this? Have you heard this before? Look at this. This is amazing. And she's like, okay. And she kept asking me all along. She's like, are you become Catholic? And I'm like, no, I don't plan on becoming Catholic. This is not, this is not what I want to do, but I'm amazed by it. This is cool. Look at this. You know? And so she's watching me just read book after book after book. And I'm just devouring. I literally spent that summer, you know, being a teacher, I have the affordability to have that, the summers off. And so I had time to just consume books. I was just reading books left and right. And she was just like, what is going on? And so when I finally just made that decision, just, yeah, I need to become Catholic. And I had to sit down and tell her, you know, we were at dinner and I said, babe, I, I'm going to become Catholic. And she's like, why? And so I had explained to her some of those reasons. And thankfully, I think for her, when she sees, it is just kind of proof in our marriage that anytime I research or I make a big decision in our family, I research it thoroughly. And I kind of always have done that in our marriage. And so she knows that when I make a decision, I'm not just kind of just running after something. I, I've researched it. I've, I've, I've made a, a solid effort to make a good decision and to do that thoroughly. And so she, she kind of knew that I'd made this decision fully and aware of what I was doing, but she's like, I'm not becoming Catholic. And I go, babe, I'm not expecting you to become Catholic. This was, this was my journey. This was my, my kind of Holy Spirit lead me through this. This is what he was doing to me. And I know he's going to, he's going to lead you. He's going to, he's going to take you wherever you are, but I'm not expecting you to become Catholic. I just want you to know that I'm making this decision that I'm going to become Catholic. And I said, you know, look, I'm not expecting you to come to mass. I'm not expecting you to do any of these things. I, I will go to mass and I will attend church with you and, and our daughter at the time. And I will still attend with you and make that happen for you. And she's, bless her heart. She said, no, we can't do that to our family. We can't rip our family apart like that. We can't have our daughter seeing us go to two different faiths. We can't do that. And she says, I'll come to mass with you and we'll go to mass together. And you know, she made that sacrifice and I, I can't ever thank her enough for that, that she was willing to attend mass with me. And she continued to ask questions. And then thankfully, it, you know, a couple of years later, she went through RCIA and with my daughter and they both came into the Catholic church and, you know, it was their own journey at their own time. It wasn't, it wasn't because I was demanding that they have to, it was because, you know, I let the Holy Spirit do the work in them that he called them to do. And, you know, I think the Holy Spirit can use us and, you know, my journey and, and just, you know, me understanding the church and helping her to understand that and walking her with that, praying for her, help her to bring, come to that point. 
but it's it's just wonderful now to be a family you know in the church it's a change it's a it's a hard change especially when you have family members that don't understand it when you have family members that are worried that your soul is in danger of course. Yeah. um you know and and i have family on my side that you know really when i decided to not be a pastor anymore that for them was like i was in a way almost you know how could i how could i do that because for a lot of Protestants, becoming a pastor is kind of the pinnacle of your faith. You know, you, you've become a pastor. Look at you, and your faith is so great that if you step away from that, what's happened? Is your faith waned? Has you have you have you lackened in your belief? Are you walking away? Mm-hmm. So for me to step down from being a pastor to become a teacher, um, and then to completely, you know, step away from, you know, a Protestant belief and into the Catholic Church, it's really scary for them that. You know, they they really worry that maybe I've you know gone off the deep end somewhere, mm-hmm. but um, you know so I still pray for them and still pray that you know the Lord will will guide them and direct them and hopefully they too will see the truth and and the beauty of the Catholic Church and and come to join that. Wow. But yeah. In a nutshell, that's pretty much my journey, and it was fast. Like I said, I read it over summer. Yeah. I joined our say that fall and that spring I became Catholic. You said uh, spring of 2017? Yep. I'll tell you what, a lot of things are happening in 2017. I've spoken to a lot of people that came into the church in 2017. I don't, I don't know what, what was going on then, but <laughs> <laughs> I was curious, was there something or was it a series of things that really registered with your wife, you know, two years into the journey or several years, you said? You know, she, she, she doesn't pinpoint anything particular. I think it was just, I think she knew this was the right thing. And I think she's still on her journey of falling in love with the church. Mm-hmm. I think she has, I think she has an ascent to the head, but it hasn't reached her heart yet. Sure. Um, I get that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think she, she see it. And I think a lot of the journey for her was her daughter, wanting her daughter to have the faith as well. And, you know, she sees dad and, you know, what dad believes. And I think she made a lot of that and sacrifice so that our daughter has something. And so I think she's still just journeying through to a true love of the church. Yeah. 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 I think uh, no doubt it's a risk. I mean, I, (laughs) I won't get into my story, but my wife and I had that same decision to make. And it's very difficult because obviously you want to be a prime witness to your kids. And when your kids look to you and you're divided in essence, in some cases, very divided. In others, there may be uh, one spouse that is like a gentleman I was talking to earlier, Missouri Synod Lutheran, and the other's Catholic versus someone that may be in, let's say not a non-denominational church, a more modern movement with a Catholic person. I think it is a tremendous uh, difficulty to figure those things out. And we've read accounts, you know, about Scott Hahn and his wife. I mean, it was probably four years or five years, maybe longer before uh, she converted. And it's just, it's a very real um, tension, I think at times, but like you said, you nailed it. You absolutely nailed it to not be overzealous and to let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit, the only the Holy Spirit can do. Only he can do. Absolutely. There's there's nothing I could have said to my wife. It's like, I don't care how many times I watched Catholic answers and had some great rebuttal to something. None of that ultimately mattered. It helped me because I was already convinced and I was just looking to strengthen my arguments. But when I say that to my wife, she would say, okay, (laughs) that's great. Good for you." you know? Yep. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, you know, and, and Rome Sweet Home was a good book for her. She read that a few times. I yeah. think that really kind of, I think the story of, of his wife really, I think it kind of helped her along in that process. And so, I think it made her feel okay that she didn't have to become Catholic right away. Sure. You know? Yeah. Hey, I was going to ask you something. Have you ever, in your, when you were reading all those books, did you Happened to read this one by... I did, yes. Yes. How phenomenal is that book? Mind-blowing. Mind-blowing. Yeah. (laughs) Those of you watching, it's uh, the author is Brent Petrie, forward by Scott Hahn. 
It's called Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist. So I'll show it to you one more time here. I just, I can't say enough about that. And if you combine it, I mean, there's so many books to, to showcase, but I, I really am partial to this as well that was released this year, Pope Peter uh, by Joe Heschmeyer. When you take, that's just one example. Those two books in tandem give so much to the history of the church and, and really help bridge that gap. You know how you talked about that gap between early church and reformation. There's also this major gap between ancient Judaism and early Catholicism. And so the books that really seek to bridge that gap as well can really help form a comprehensive view of church history that I think just gets overlooked because it's, yeah. it's heavy reading. <laughs> you know what I mean? So Yeah, but even, even though, I mean, as a, as a Protestant, you know, we look at the Jewish church and you look at how they worshiped, everything was a sacrifice, right? That, that was the center of all their worship. Absolutely. But, but you look at a Protestant worship today, and it's nowhere near what Jesus would have done. I mean, we, we, we sing songs and we listen to a guy speak. And there, where, where's worship happening in that? We, we say we sing worship songs, which is great, but there's no actual formal sacrifice being taken place. And, and that was always in, in the back of my mind. I always was kind of wondering, where is the sacrifice taking place at? Like, how did, how did worship all of a sudden change? So becoming Catholic, it all of a sudden put that piece back in there for me. Mm -hmm. that at our mass, we have a sacrifice every time we have mass. It is the sacrifice that is taking place there that the priest is leading us up as the priest did in the Old Testament. And he's, he's taking that sacrifice and presenting it to the Lord for us. Um, and it, it just is a beautiful combination to see that, yeah, it wasn't like, you know, Jesus just kind of changed everything and this is the new way how we're going to worship. It's still very much in union with how it has been done for centuries. You know, it's not exactly. a complete divorce and radical change. Exactly. It, it's just, it's just interpreted through him as our sacrifice that is given once and for all. Yeah. The memorial, the ultimate right. memorial and remembrance. And, you know, as lay people, even the sacrifice that we should be coming with, like, how can I be conformed more to Christ this week? You know, that, that part growing up Catholic, I didn't, that didn't register. That honestly didn't register until probably um, six months ago where to prepare your heart to be ready to just surrender more and surrender more and be conformed <laughs> more to Christ. Once that hit me, I, I just started tearing up. I'm like, that's it that's it. You know, it's not just about God. What can you, <laughs> what, what can you do for me? It's how can I be more and more like Christ and how will your sanctifying grace allow for that? And that just right. rocked me, you know? Right. I often see it too, is I have the intentions. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better father. I want to be a better follower of Christ. And when I go to mass, I can, I can lay those things on the altar and say, you know, here's the intentions of what I want to be. Will you sanctify that and, and yeah. take those intentions and purify it for me? Yeah. <laughs> Cause I'm feeble and I fail and yeah. you know, but I, I want, I want to do more. I want to be more for you. I, I you know, when you're in the mass, Christ on the cross and his sacrifice is so prevalent throughout the mass that it just forces you to just want to give more of your life for him. It, it changes you. It transforms you because you see that sacrifice happening, right? I'm not just talking about it. I'm not just singing about it. I'm not just learning about it. I'm actually visually seeing it happen again. Yeah. yeah. And it's a reminder of, I need to daily lay down myself. I need to transform as well. And I can't do that on my own. I need I need the sacraments. I need to have those sacraments that are infused with his grace to help me to do that. Exactly. Could not agree more. Um, last, last question. Um, and I think I've asked a number of guests this. What's life like now, you know, three years later, almost four years later, after the conversion, do you feel that you're able to talk about your faith openly among Protestants? Do you feel like this is a way to build a bridge? You know, I, I kind of want to understand from an ecumenical standpoint, how is that, how is that going for you? 
So I think the hardest part is, is that I, you don't want to be in an argument. And it's, and it's so easy to do because a lot of times when you're, when you're talking with your, your friends that are Protestant, they want to argue certain points. And it's, and it's not really the point. It's like, I, I'll, I'll be willing to tell you what I believe and, and why I come to that, but I don't want to argue about it. I'm not here to have an argument. And so it's really hard to have that because it, it just instantly goes to that. And as soon as you, you kind of discuss the one point that they had that they feel like this is the reason why the church is false, it moves on to shifts to multiple different points and you're never really answering that question. Yep. And so for me coming into this, into the church, it was, it was stories. When you hear someone's story, you can't argue an experience, right? That is somebody's story that that's personal to them. That's their fallacy that they hold that they hold on to that they can they can launch from their truths from, and so when you hear the stories, it's the stories that help you question and wonder. Okay, why did they make that decision? Okay, I've never heard that truth before. I've never heard that before in this way, or maybe they interpret it in their life through a different lens that maybe has a context in your life through a lens that you're looking at, and you can connect to that person and their story. And so, it's hard to because you want to discuss the points. Like I want to discuss and refute and I want to, and I can tend to go that direction and be all heady. But it's the stories that I think is what connects us. It's, it's, what, it's how Jesus taught. Jesus taught through stories. That's, that's how people connected to these huge truths that he was trying to convey to them through simple stories that they could find a context into. And so, it's hard because I don't get to share the stories because they want to argue the points. But for me as a teacher, I get to share the stories to my kids. I get to talk about our faith through the lens of, of a conversion, through the lens of somebody who's seen it for the first time, who somebody who's passionately excited about it for the first time. Um, and so you get to share those stories or I get to share them with my parents in, in, in my classroom. And what I like to do in my classroom is I, um, instead of writing a newsletter each week, I actually have a podcast and I, and I do all my classroom information through a podcast. And then I just share stories. You know, maybe something spoke to me that week that God was speaking to me or teaching through me through some reading or through the scriptures. And then I can just share those stories through the context of my faith Got and it. get to share that with others. And, you know, that's just for me, I think that is the best way for that to be, to be told is in a story. I mean, I would love to debate. I would love to have those arguments, but you know, they just go around and around and no, you just no. never, you never land on one place to answer that question. You're a smart man. That's such a good, such a good point. It's almost like you're circumventing the entire uh, expected path <laughs> really. Cause I think that that is human nature. We expect that if we bring up some type of point, you know, if, if as Catholics we're arguing for something, we're waiting for someone to maybe come back with, a rebuttal and then you're off to the races. So, um, very interesting. I, that was awesome. Seriously, Eric, I, you know, every time I've spoken to you and it's only been a handful of times, you really do. Um, your zeal shines through and it encourages me and I guarantee it encourages the other brothers that we've been around. So I just want to commend you for all the work you're doing and thank you for being uh, willing to share your testimony and willing to be on this on this little show here. So yeah, thanks again. I'm glad, I'm glad to get the story out a little bit. Awesome. All right. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Catholic Recon. Until next time, take care and God bless.